Well, welcome to the Barbican with me, Brian Cox, Dahlia Stavesca and the BBC Symphony Orchestra for a night of cosmology and contemplation. Um, I'd like to thank all the patrons of the Barbican who've made this live stream possible. Um, what we're going to do tonight is um, it's an idea I've been thinking about for a long time, which is that the challenges, the ideas that, are, that, that come into our minds when we contemplate the, the universe, cosmology and astronomy, um, are challenging ideas that I think are best explored not only through science, because after all, as I will say tonight, you don't find meaning through the eyepiece of a telescope, but also through music. And so we're going to approach ideas of the origin of the universe, the end of the universe, but particularly the meaning of it all. And again, as I'll say in the concert, um, well, I don't want to spoil your fun, but I'm not going to tell you what the meaning of it all is, because if I knew, then it would be more than £12 a ticket. I think there is only one interesting existential question. What does it mean to live a small, finite life in a possibly infinite, eternal universe?
Cosmology is the study of the large-scale structure of the universe. It's a science of 
origins, uh, a science of evolution and endings, not only of individual lives or civilizations, or even planets and stars, but of everything that ever existed and everything that will ever exist. It's a science, I think, that brings into very sharp focus deep questions, uh, questions that are usually associated, I think, with philosophy or even theology. Uh, what does it mean to live a small, finite, fragile life in an infinite and quite possibly eternal universe? Now, now science alone, of course, cannot answer those questions, and I'm not going to answer those questions tonight either, primarily because I don't know. And that's a very important point. We don't know. Nobody knows the answer to that question. Um, in a very famous speech in 1955, the Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist Richard Feynman um, considered the value of science. So what is the value of science to civilization, to society? Um, how can it contribute to our quest for meaning? And of course he said that science is useful. It's the thing that builds us iPhones or vaccines. Um, it's also a very joyful activity for the people that pursue it. And that's important. Uh, the pursuit of joy is an, uh, an important part of what it means to be human. But finally, uh, Feynman decided or came to the conclusion that the most valuable thing of all, the most valuable lesson that science gives us, is the embracing of doubt. This idea that nobody knows the answer. In fact, he called science a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance for that reason, that nature brings us face to face with our own ignorance. And in fact, the last paragraph of that very famous speech is worth repeating. Um, this is what Feynman wrote about the value of science. He said, it is our responsibility as scientists, knowing the great progress which comes from a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance, the great progress, which is the fruit of freedom of thought, to proclaim the value of this freedom, to teach how doubt is not to be feared, but welcomed and discussed, and to demand this freedom as our duty to all coming generations. Science is merely a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance, but that realization is key. Uh, the open channel as Feynman puts it, to unlock the infinite and wondrous capacities of human beings. Now, the central idea behind this concert, this concert is that music and science are two of the different ways that we explore, that we explore these fundamental questions. Both are necessary, neither is sufficient. I mean, science can't be sufficient on its own. Uh, as I've said, <laughs> we don't know everything. It's a philosophy of ignorance. And anyway, we won't find meaning through the eyepiece of a telescope. But there are insights, I think, that could be only expressed through equations. And there are also insights that can only be expressed through music. And perhaps, I think, there are, there are insights that can only be expressed through both. So what is... Uh, the scientific perspective in terms, first of all, of our place in the universe. Where are humans in the universe? Uh, this image that you've been looking at as I've been talking is, um, I think, a beautiful image. It's not the most spectacular image of the Earth ever taken, but as you see, it's a very delicate, fragile image of the Earth-Moon system, a two presence against the blackness of space. I always think, actually, that the further away from the Earth you get, uh, the more powerful the image becomes. This is a remarkable image, actually, when you know from where it was taken, it was taken from Martian orbit by a spacecraft called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And from this distance, I think you do immediately get a sense of the beauty, but also fragility of our planet. Now, we now know that our planet is one planet around one star amongst 400 billion stars in our local island of stars, the Milky Way galaxy. Um, this is an image of the uh, entire Milky Way from all points around the Earth's surface, both northern and southern hemisphere. So the whole sweep of our galaxy across the sky. Um, since the mid-1990s, we've been discovering planets around these stars. Uh, we now have discovered over 4,000 planets in the Milky Way galaxy. 
that allows us to estimate with real confidence that virtually every star in the sky has a planet around it, at least one, uh, probably a solar system. We estimate that there are of order 20 billion potentially Earth-like planets around the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. That one in 10, maybe one in 20 of those stars has a planet that's the right distance from the star, potentially, if the conditions are right, to support water on the surface and therefore potentially life. So one star around one of 400 billion stars in an island of stars, which itself is one of two trillion galaxies in the observable universe. And this image is one of the most famous images in the history of astronomy, I think. It's called the Hubble Deep Field Image. It gives a powerful sense of the size and scale of the universe. And this is an image of a piece of sky that is reasonably empty from the surface of the Earth, an unremarkable piece of sky. It's a piece of sky you would cover if you took um, a coin, five pence piece, maybe a pound coin, maybe a euro, and held it about, uh, let's say, 20 metres away. So you imagine covering a small piece of sky. Um, that's the size of this image. But in this image, there are 10,000 galaxies. Pretty much every point of light you see in this image is a galaxy, an island of billions of stars, just like the Milky Way. So it is undoubtedly true that we are small and we are physically insignificant. Um, however, if we go back to the Earth, reflecting on that physical insignificance, there may be something, or I think there is something, I can say with confidence, that may be special about this world. It is, as far as we know, at the moment, the only place where life exists. Now, as I've said, there are plenty of places out there in the typical galaxy where life may exist, but we haven't discovered life beyond Earth yet. So how could we estimate? Let's say that we want to consider the Earth as perhaps a special place amongst that ocean of stars. Can we estimate the possibility or the probability that life may exist out there? having not detected any. Well, we can look at the history of life on Earth to give us some clues. So what do we know about the history of life on this world? Well, we know that it began around 3.8 billion years ago, almost certainly in the deep oceans of the primordial Earth. That's an interesting observation in itself. 3.8 billion to 4 billion years ago, that means that life began on this world pretty much as soon as it could, after the Earth had formed and cooled down and the, and the oceans had formed on its surface. The Earth is around four and a half billion years old. So that gives some biologists a sense, perhaps, that if not a sense of inevitability about the origin of life, then at least perhaps a sense that life, given the right conditions, may emerge on a world. And what we're saying is the transition from geochemistry to biochemistry that happened in places like this in the primordial oceans of Earth may be, well, essentially just chemistry. You get active geochemistry on the surface of an ocean, maybe complex carbon chemistry emerges that ultimately can pass information on from generation to generation, and you have the origin of life. So life may be common throughout the universe, given that it began here very quickly. However, if you then ask a different question, which is when did complex life appear on this planet, then you get a very different answer. Um, this is a photograph of a place called the Burgess Shale in Canada, one of the oldest fossil beds that we find on Earth. The fossils here uh, emerged in what's called the Cambrian Explosion at around 550, 560 million years ago. There is no evidence of complex life on Earth further back than around 700 million. Some people perhaps say you could push that back to a billion, certainly no earlier than that. So the history of life on Earth tells us that yes, life was present around 4 billion years ago, but then it took 3 billion years, perhaps more, for that simple life to become complex. And then another half a billion years on top of that, for that complex life to become 
sentient, to become conscious, to begin to think in the way that we do for us to appear, for a civilization to appear on this planet. Now, that gives many biologists the sense that if we look out into the universe, maybe we'll find complex, uh, simple life, microbes and so on, maybe subsurface on Mars, maybe on the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, maybe on some of those Earth-like planets around the stars in the Milky Way. But if you ask a biologist to guess, will there be complex life on those worlds? Many biologists I know think probably not. I have a very good friend at the University of Manchester. I always use his quote. I asked him once, uh, what do you think you'll see if you look into the Milky Way? If we could look at those worlds, those countless billions of worlds in the arc of light across the sky, uh, what would we see? And he said to me, um, I think all there is up there is slime. Now, that's interesting, because we began the evening, I've mentioned it a couple of times already, this idea of meaning. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to live these fragile, finite lives? That meaning. That meaning does not sound like a scientific concept. But I would argue that whatever it is, it exists, because the universe means something to us, of course. Um, and it's a property of atoms, it's a property, a physical property of the universe. It's a property of human brains. Think about what we are. We are collections of atoms. Atoms that have been around pretty much since the origin of the universe. But we are collections of atoms that can think and feel and write symphonies and do science. How probable is it that collections of atoms like that form according to the laws of nature in this universe? Well, as I've argued, it could well be that the answer is, it is not very probable at all. It took four billion years on this planet, one third of the age of the universe. Very few of those solar systems in this galaxy that we know of will be stable for that kind of length of time. And so we are left with, a, I think, a dual view of our planet on the one side, on the one hand, it is physically insignificant. But on the other hand, we can make a reasonable argument that it is incredibly valuable, because think about it. Think about the possibility that this is the only world in our galaxy where those atoms got together to think. That, in my language, would mean that this planet is the only island of meaning in a galaxy of 400 billion suns. Now imagine if that's true. I think it's a good work in hypothesis, actually. What does that tell us about how we should behave here on Earth, on this indescribably valuable world? There's Feynman again, They're talking about the value of science, in this case, the value of perspective. So we're left with these two perspectives. They appear at first sight to be incompatible, or at least to jar against each other, physically insignificant, and yet perhaps extremely valuable. I think that the space between ideas is a place where deeper understanding can be glimpsed, if not necessarily expressed in words. Science has provided a window overlooking this unexplored terrain. But perhaps this landscape bounded by these two ideas, our insignificance on one hand and our value on the other, is best explored through music. The unanswered question. There are great unanswered questions that remain. We've spoken about our position in the universe, perhaps the importance of life in the universe. But what do we know about the origins of the universe, the origins of everything? Uh, perhaps one of the, or perhaps the greatest question that we could possibly ask. Why is there a universe at all? How did it come into existence? Well, if we deal with the origin of the universe first, um, remarkably, that's a, a relatively answered question to some extent. The reason is that as we look out deep into the universe, we look back in time. Uh, remember this image again, the, the Hubble Deep Field image, those 10,000 galaxies in a small patch of space. The light from the most distant galaxies in this image took over 13 billion years to reach us. That means that images like this are, in a sense, four-dimensional. We're not only looking deep out into the universe, 
We're looking deep out into time. In this case, 13 billion years back in time. So you might ask the question, well, if that's the case, then can we look so far away out into the universe that we look so far back in time that we can see the origin of the universe itself? We can observe the beginning of everything. Well, almost is the answer to that question, in a sense. This is an image of the most ancient light, the oldest light in the universe. It's an image called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, it's presented in this way as a sphere because it's an image of the entire sky. So this is the celestial sphere, if you'd like. And it's the light that you see if you look as far as you can in every direction around the Earth. Light that's travelled across the universe for 13.8 billion years to reach us. So this is a photograph of the young universe. The first thing to say is that what we see here is a universe that is very different from the universe we see today. You could have made the claim that our universe is eternal in the sense that it's always been this way. It's always been filled with stars and planets and galaxies. That's indeed what many great physicists thought at the turn of the 20th century. Einstein had a strong predisposition for that view earlier on in his career, an eternal universe. What this image tells you is that, well, as we'll see, the universe may still be eternal, but it's changed a lot. This is a photograph of a universe with no stars, no planets, and no galaxies. What essentially you're looking at is a glowing universe filled with an almost uniform sea of gas, hydrogen and helium, virtually nothing else. The colours in this image correspond to regions of very slightly different density in that almost uniform sea of gas. It's the only structure that there is in this young universe. Now those patches um, of slight over-density and under-density are extremely important. The, the variation, by the way, is about one part in a hundred thousand. So it's almost completely smooth, but not quite. They're important because as the universe expanded and cooled from this very uh, hot, uh, dense uh, universe filled with gas 13.8 billion years ago, the over-dense regions began to collapse under their own gravity and ultimately form the first stars and galaxies. So without these slight variations you see in this photograph, because indeed you can regard it as a photograph of the young universe, we would not exist. Um, George Smoot, who got the Nobel Prize for first detecting these so-called ripples in the young universe, ripples in the CMB, said that images like this are like looking at the face of God, because they are, in a sense, showing us the seeds of our creation. Now you might ask, um, and it would be a good question, well how then did we go from this universe, which is almost featureless and very simple 13.8 billion years ago, to the universe we see today? A universe filled with stars, planets and galaxies, yes, but also planets like this one, planets like the Earth with a civilization. You can see in this beautiful image of the Earth at night, a civilization on the surface, the most complex thing we know of anywhere in the universe. How do you go from a simple universe to a complex, living, conscious universe through the action of a few simple laws of nature? Well, remarkably, broadly speaking, we have an understanding, at least in broad sweep, of the processes that are involved. Um, there's a very good paper by a friend of mine, a cosmologist, Sean Carroll, called The Universe in a Cup of Coffee. Uh, where he explains in broad sweep the physical processes at play. Now, imagine a cup of coffee with the cream on top and the coffee underneath. So you've separated the cream out. Um, that's what a physicist would call a highly ordered system, because the cream is well delineated. It's in one place and the coffee is in a different place. They're not mixed. And then imagine putting a spoon in the coffee and mixing it. What happens? The system becomes a disordered system. It moves from order to disorder. The jargon in physics terms is low entropy to high entropy. But in the process of that transition from order to disorder, if you look carefully, you will see swirls in the coffee, swirls of cream, complexity in the physical system, temporarily 
on the journey from order to chaos. And that is essentially uh, what we believe happened in our universe, or is happening, I should say, in our universe. So we started with a universe that was highly ordered. This universe here that we photograph is a highly ordered universe. Uh, gravity is a long-range force that causes interactions between different bits of the universe and tends to clump them together. That process is a journey from order to disorder. Now, that's um, a powerful idea, but it also raises an extremely powerful question. Because in terms of the coffee, or a powerful realisation, I should say, in terms of the cup of coffee, the swirls are temporary. That seems to be a property of systems such as this. If you start in a highly ordered state and go to a disordered state, you can get structure emerging temporarily on the journey from order to disorder. Now, that's important. If that's the description of the universe, and we think it is in a broad sweep, um, then it raises, um, well, I think a very important realisation. Um, you could say that we exist not in spite of the fact that the universe decays, but because of the fact that the universe decays. Now, the second question that raises, of course, if we accept that broad description, is how did the universe get into this simple state in the first place? Uh, with a cup of coffee, we know we put the cream on. There's a hint of Paley's watch about it, if you know your evolutionary biology. So we ask the question, how did the universe get set up such that it can go on this journey and produce complexity, uh, at least temporarily, in the universe? That's what we are, by the way. We are the swirls in the coffee in this model. Well, this is where we get slightly more speculative, uh, but we're still on quite firm ground because we have a theory of how the universe got into this state. It's a theory called inflation. Uh, the idea is that before the universe was hot and dense, so I could say before the Big Bang, or to be specific, before the hot Big Bang, this thing that we observe in our past, the universe was still there. Space and time were still there. The universe was cold and it was empty, but it was expanding extremely fast. Um, that's why the theory is called inflation. Now, you imagine two points in this universe. Um, the, uni the distance between them was doubling, according to this theory, every, in scientific language, 10 to the minus 37 seconds. That's one ten million 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 millionths of a second. So that's inflation is a good name. It's an extremely rapid expansion. And the picture is that that period of inflation, of expansion, drew to a close. And all the energy driving that expansion was dumped into the universe, heated it up, made particles, and that's what we call the Big Bang. So that's a theory of the universe before the Big Bang. Now, why would we think that? Um, well, there were technical reasons why people introduced that theory, but a key point is it was a predictive theory. It predicted the pattern that we see in the cosmic microwave background radiation, those colours, the seeds of our creation, as I called them. It predicted them before they were observed. So we have some confidence in this theory. But there are two uh, profound uh, predictions, almost predictions, but things to mention, if you like, about this theory. Strong suggestions that are quite mind-blowing, I think. The first one is this. So imagine a little patch of space during inflation, a little patch that's about a billionth of the size of the nucleus of an atom. The reason that we consider that patch is that this patch, 13.8 billion years later, is going to be our entire observable universe. The picture is that it expanded, inflating, until it was about the size of this theatre, actually the Barbican, give or take. So it expanded to about this size. And that's when inflation stopped. The energy got dumped into here. And in a space about as big as this, there was enough energy to produce all the matter and everything else in the two trillion galaxies in the observable universe that we can see. It's an almost unimaginably violent event uh, in the history of the universe. That's one little patch 
The only reason I'm interested is because that patch became our observable universe. What about the other patches? There would be patches nearby. Um, what happened to them? Well, they would have expanded too. But they'll be so far away now that the light has not been able to reach us from those patches, so we can't see them. So inflation has an immediate consequence, which is that the universe we can see with two trillion galaxies in it is actually only a very small patch of what's out there. There will be galaxies way beyond the horizon, far further out than we could possibly ever see, and that universe may extend forever. So we've been relegated again. We're not only now one planet around one star amongst 400 billion in one galaxy amongst two trillion. Our patch of the universe with the two trillion galaxies is a small patch of everything that's out there. But it gets even worse than that, or better. I don't know what the word is. Um, you might say, well, uh, you, we've got this theory then, and it's quite predictive, and it says the universe stretches and then it stops, and the energy gets dumped into space and makes everything. Why does it all stop at once? Why does the whole thing have to stop inflating at the same time? And the answer is, as far as we can tell, it doesn't. It doesn't have to stop inflating at the same time. The picture could be that patches of this stretching universe stop, and all the energy gets dumped into the space, and it makes a big bang and makes a little pocket universe, if you like. The rest of it carries on, and then somewhere else, another patch stops and makes another universe. Another patch stops and makes another universe. So actually the picture of reality is more like this. We call it the inflationary multiverse, where there is a constant production of universes, or bubble universes if you like, from this potentiality, the inflating universe that's the background if you like. And this process could have been going on possibly forever. We don't know. All we have a measurement of is the age of our bubble, which is the time back to the hot big bang. We really don't know enough physics to make a judgment on what happened before that time. So we could live in a universe that's producing other universes now as we speak, and has always been producing universes, an eternal universe. Um, perhaps we'll never fully understand those theories and be able to answer the question, even did the universe have a beginning? I mean, think about it. If the universe is eternal, uh, what does that mean? We talk about meaning. What does it mean for theology? What does it mean for the idea of a creator? If we do discover, through observation and theory, that our universe is eternal, does that mean, um, in Stephen Hawking's famous phrase, we know the mind of God? Um, I don't know. We're not at that stage yet. Um, so let me uh, give you my impression of where we are and what these uh, remarkable physical theories and observations mean. Um, I think that if it's true that there are very few places in the universe where atoms have come together to contemplate the existence of atoms, to think, as I said, to write symphonies and do science, then Earth, notwithstanding its physical insignificance, is a remarkably valuable place indeed. How valuable? Well, if meaning is a property which emerges from collections of atoms on a very few worlds for a very short space of time, then it's local and it's temporary. Now, if this is correct, then if we destroy ourselves through inaction or perhaps deliberately, perhaps because we just don't think about our value, then we might also destroy meaning in the Milky Way galaxy, in a galaxy of 400 billion stars, perhaps forever. I mean, maybe we'll discover the universe is infinite in extent. Maybe we'll discover that there are an infinite number of universes. But it's possible the laws of nature vary in these bubbles. It's possible that in many of these bubbles, the laws of nature prevent life and therefore meaning from existing in those bubble universes. Large swathes of the multiverse may be meaningless too. Therefore, it's my view that we may be far more valuable than any of us can possibly comprehend. Our, our worldview, our politics, the way we behave as people, as citizens, the way we behave to each other may matter. 
not only beyond the horizons marked out by our towns and cities or countries, but also beyond the shores of our planet, maybe even beyond the shores of our galaxy. Our lives are short. The lifetime of our civilization is finite. But these precious moments in cosmic time bring meaning to an otherwise meaningless universe. So in my view, we are indescribably valuable, rare and remarkable natural structures composed of atoms as old as time. Meaning is located within us, and it is our responsibility to cherish it and to protect it. Now, I don't think words alone do justice to these thoughts. These are just my thoughts and my words after all. So I want to leave the last word to the orchestra and to Marla to deliver what is to me uh, the most eloquent exploration of meaning, uh, the meaning of our finite lives in this infinite universe. Mm -hmm.